the Israeli people have gone to the polls, the early returns are in, and the Israeli people have answered the big political question in Israel. Is it time for Bibi Netanyahu to exit the Israeli stage, or will he be yet again Israel's Prime Minister? I'm Mark Golub. We're coming to you live at 6 p.m. Eastern Time from our JBS Election Central in the heart of New York's Times Square. In a moment, we'll be turning for insight and analysis to a wonderful panel. But first, let's go to JBS News anchor Tisha Bader with the results of today's Israeli national election. Tisha. Thank you so much, Mark. We're going to look at the exit poll from Israel's Channel 12, which is one of Israel's leading news channels. Let's start with blue and white. With 33 seats, Labor Gesher merits with seven, adding up to 40 seats. Now, keep in mind, United, the uh, joint Arab list rather has 14 seats, they, though they would not join any coalition. Taking a look now at Likud, coming in very strong with 37 seats, Shas with nine seats, and then United Torah Judaism and Yamina with seven seats each. We also still have six seats for Avigdor Lieberman's Yisrael Beitenu party. It is really not clear, though, at this point whether he would, in fact, join a coalition with Likud. Sending it back to you, Mark. Thank you so much, Tisha. So the questions regarding how the Israeli people feel about Benjamin Netanyahu may have been answered in today's election. He may have 60 already committed seats. He needs 61. So as you see, there's no ready-made coalition for him. So there's a lot to talk about. And I'm so pleased to be joined by a wonderful group of deeply committed Jews to share their insights and analysis. First, we're joined by JBS Senior Vice President and a former career diplomat with the Israeli Foreign Ministry, Shahar Azani. We're also joined by Steve Baim, Director of the Contemporary Jewish Life Department of the American Jewish Committee and of the Kuppelman Institute on American Jewish Israeli Relations. We're also joined by Susan Rosenbluth. And Susie is the editor of the Jewish news website, jewishvoiceandopinion.com. And from Israel, we're joined by Emily Schrader, a political consultant in Israel who's a regular columnist for the Jerusalem Post. I thank you all for joining us on JBS to sort of share your thoughts about the Israeli election. And Shachar, I begin with you. I already mentioned you spent years and years in the Israeli diplomatic corps as you look at the results that have come in, what's it tell you about where the Israeli electorate is as a result of these early election results? Well, it's, it's quite incredible, first of all, to see Benjamin Netanyahu's um, political shrewdness and ability to campaign as Israel's best campaigner. Whatever you think of him, the appreciation to the amounts of energy he put in, uh, going from one place to another and really galvanizing the masses, remembering the lesson of September 2019, where um, not enough voters turned out for Likud. Secondly, which By is... By the way, that's a very important point. Let's put up the election, return, the, the amount of people, the, the percentage of people who turned out in this election as opposed to the last two. Remember, we had an election in September of 19, then we had a... a, a I'm sorry, we had an election in April, we had an election in September, and we had an election today. How do you look at these so, returns? So just one correction. April was 67.9. September was 69.4. And today was 71%. You can see the Israeli masses going out to cast their votes and make a decision in Israel's unbelievable and unprecedented impasse. And I think you also should remember, looking into this, the amazing reality where the two parties that were constructing the major coalition in 1992, and that is the Israeli Labor Party and Meretz, creating the Rabin Peres government at the time, have now shrunk to the unbelievable number of six or seven seats in the Knesset. And I think that tells you a lot about where the Israeli public is today. That's fascinating. I want to show another slide. I want to show the slide of the results of the last, now, three elections. And Shachar, I want you to sort of walk us through here, because it's amazing to see the differences for the various parties. Um, today, Likud went from 32 in September to 37. There's, by the way, 
these, rep these tallies are not final. And it could be that Lee could only uh, ended up with 36, but it's still, Shachar, a jump from 32 yeah. in September. And Shachar remains the same. United Torah at the moment remains the same. Yamina remains the same. And blue and white remains the same. So it's interesting. Labor, Gesher, and Merits, and that's what you were referring to, which had 11 in September as a group, the three parties that are, that are joined together, Labor Party, Gesher, and Merits Party. And as you say, at one point, Merits and Labor were the state of Israel. How do you read this? Well, I think it's a, what you'll hear from many people is that in April of 2019, Netanyahu had the same block of 60 like today, so as if nothing has changed. But so much has changed, because in the course of the past year, we've seen Netanyahu being indicted in court. You're talking about the prime minister who is facing a court a hearing on March 17th. And yet, the Israeli public came forth and said, we are okay with it. The prime minister will continue to lead Israel while proving his case in court. This is a very significant element. And I want to add one more thing. We may be moving to the next phase, which may not be political, but rather legal. In January of 2020, a group of 70 individuals from Israel petitioned the court, telling the Israeli Supreme Court, could it be that an indicted member of Knesset may be given the keys by Israel president to create the next coalition government. The court rejected the petition, but not on merit. The court indicated at this point in time, this is merely a theoretic issue. When it becomes a practical one, it is justiciable. So it's very likely that even if Netanyahu emerges victorious, there will be the same petition brought before the court, at which point the Israeli attorney general will have to make up his mind and then go to the Supreme Court to decide on this crucial issue. Fascinating. Steve, as you look at these results, does anything jump out at you? And I would ask you if you wish to make a comment on Shachar's observation that at one point in our lifetime, it seemed like just yesterday, <laughs> labor and merits were the coalition, the it, they were the Israeli government, and now they're just sort of limping along. But in general, how do you view what happened today? Well, perhaps I can start with this last point. Um, reality is Israel is very much of a center-leaning right society today. Uh, the labor ascendancy of 48 to 77, we saw it come back a bit in the 1990s. But that labor ascendancy was based upon a society that was center-leaning left. The real implication of this, of this election clearly is that, and, and its pr two predecessors, is that there was very little difference on foreign policy, very little difference on security issues between Likud and Blue and White. So in that respect, um, it should not be surprising that labor and, and merits have shrunk so badly. It's surprising from a historical perspective because they once, once were in the ascendancy. But given the reality of Israel as a center-leading right society, and that's the broad consensus, the religious parties they differ on, on issues of religion, but they also are center-leaning right. So I can't be surprised by that. Um, it suggests, if you will, that there is a still, still a very strong Jewish consensus that permeates society. It shifted rightward from the, old, from, the old, from the older days when labor was in the ascendancy, but the consensus is still there. I want you to develop that idea for one moment. What's it mean to say that the Israeli electorate has moved to the right? In what way are, in America, right and left tends to be conservative and liberal. I'm not sure the same words apply to the Israeli electorate. When you say it's now center-right, what do you mean? I mean, first of all, it, it remains a democracy. And in that respect, the people have spoken. But their, their own leanings and inclinations are to vote for center-leading right parties. What's right mean? They have certainly have marginalized Atzma Yehudit, and in other words, the extremist party, now for the third straight time, has not passed the, threat, the threshold. And that party is extreme on the right. Exactly. Okay. Um, so in that respect, it remains what I call a center-leading right society. Um, in terms of how that plays out in terms of issues, in terms of looking ahead, um, I don't think the, um, uh, the classic differences over Oslo, uh, the approach to a peace process, the issue of settlements, all these things were quite divisive uh, in previous years. The current consensus, I still would like to think that most Israelis would favor a serious two-state solution if one were really in the bag. But putting that aside, it's not on the horizon. Most Israelis are making a statement that they trust Mr. Netanyahu on security issues. He has missed the security. 
They trust his relationship with the United States, uh, in terms, certainly in terms of the current administration. And uh, as was uh, Shachar mentioned, he happens to be an incredible campaigner who uh, showed his, uh, he showed his medal during, the, during this past campaign. So in that respect, when I say it's a center-leaning right society, what I'm suggesting is that the broad consensus is that we are not terribly optimistic about any kind of serious peace process. What we want is someone who will secure Israel in terms of the, uh, the dangers and risks it faces, such as the issue of uh, an Iranian bomb, for example. Okay, I'm gonna come back to you, but Susie, what's your sense as you see what seems to be a, a Netanyahu now in a position to actually form the next coalition government? And in a moment, I'm gonna want you, Shachar, to explain how he does that. Because 60 doesn't do it, 59 certainly doesn't do it. But at the moment, it looks like Netanyahu is coming out very strong. What's your sense? First of all, we haven't heard from the army yet. So that those votes still have to be tallied in. And which is why most people that I've been speaking to in Israel have told us, hold on, wait, it's coming. Do they expect there to be a difference? Yes. In what way? They expect it to be more favorable to the right, to, to Bibi Netanyahu and that coalition. Okay. Are you saying he could win another seat? Yes. Shachar, does that make sense to you? That could happen. However, um, it's worthwhile to indicate that the exit poll by Israel's major news channel 12 just changed and has given one more seat to the Arabs. So Bibi's block is now 59. And we shall see what happens. I agree completely with Susie. We have to wait until the, every vote is counted. It's critical to know where we stand now. Every, every seat matters. Okay. And do you agree with Susie? The sense is if the vote changes because of the army's vote, they will tend to go for Bibi. Well, historically that's been the case, but again, remember, this was a, the only issue that was on the table in these elections, was not social, was not economic, economic was not even security. It was Netanyahu, yes himself. or no. Himself, That yes. is it. Yes, which is an interesting phenomenon. We haven't seen that in Israel, no, I don't believe. No, Netanyahu okay. has brought Israeli and politics to And that's really what's so interesting, because when you spoke to people in blue and white, it felt like, hey, wait a minute, don't, whatever you do, don't call us leaning left. We're not leaning left. Which? We're going to, we're here on security. No one is talking about vacating the, the, uh, the Shtachen, the, the communities in, in Judea and Samaria. Nobody is talking about running away from the Jordan Valley. Don't, th th that's what I heard right. every time I spoke to anybody in right. blue and white. We're not left. Don't call us left wing. Right. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, and, and also remember that regardless of BBS or BB no, at the end of the day, this is what the Israelis had to decide upon, yes. whether they're willing to go ahead with Netanyahu, and even Blue and White itself had that option. That's correct. In the round of October, yes. Blue and White could have agreed to yes. a government of national unity with Netanyahu, at which point, in about a month from now, Gantz would have assumed position as prime minister. Correct. They refused to do so, carrying forth the banner of only just no BB. That's correct. And this is the price they may be paying now. Did this surprise you? Did the outcome surprise you? I used to say that I, I felt very strongly about what I used to call the Israeli chicken. It had a right wing and a left wing and nothing in the middle. Uh, so was I surprised? I was kind of expecting the same stalemate because it was not about leaning left or leaning right. And that's how it was played here. When you listen to Americans talking about the, the election, the Americans were talking about, well, we hope that we'll come to be a sensible, leaning left government. And I said, who are you talking to? Who is saying this to you? Certainly not in Israel. Nobody in Israel wanted to say to me, think about us as the left wing. The issue even about whether they could form a government with Arab support, everybody I spoke to in blue and white said, don't look for it. It's not going to happen. Everybody I spoke to on the Arab list told me, don't look for it, it's not going to happen. I mean, if I can't believe them on the ground, we're going to say, no, they're not telling the but, truth. But here is a question. Had it not been Benjamin Netanyahu leading the Likud, had it been somebody else, would we have seen a different result? I'm not sure that we would have seen the same result vis-a-vis -vis Likud. We could have definitely seen a fresh, new face, whether it's blue and white, you said center-right, and that's correct, Stephen, and it could have been completely upside down. The only difference here, and this is yes, BB, no, BB. Interesting. Correct. Correct. Emily, you're listening as we talk here at the table. You're on the ground in Israel. First of all, 
can you tell me what the mood is if I were on the streets of Tel Aviv or Jerusalem or Netanya or anywhere in Israel? What is the feeling of the, Ameri of the uh, Israeli electorate as they went to the polls today? And then I want your assessment of what these early results seem to say about Israel's continuing embrace of Benjamin Netanyahu. Right, so first things um, In regards to the general sentiment, I mean, it depends a lot on where you are in Israel. Um, I'm in Tel Aviv, so obviously it's not quite as representative as some of the other areas in the election results. Um, the attitude in Tel Aviv is pretty bad, <laughs> should I say. Tel Aviv tends to be kind of a left-wing bubble, um, and it's actually one of the reasons that they're, they're saying uh, blue and white really fell short because the voter turnout in Tel Aviv was significantly lower even than last elections as opposed to the periphery and cities outside of Tel Aviv that turned out, especially Likud's stronghold cities like Ashkelon and like Rehobot, um, that turned out very, very strongly for Netanyahu. Um, in regards to some of the comments that were made earlier, I'm not so sure, I'm not convinced at least, that the election results we're seeing now and the strong Likud uh, growth that we saw from the last election is a statement in of faith in Netanyahu as much as it is that um, Likud had a lot of access um, to the entire voter base. Um, I don't know if this has been discussed here, but um, their app that they used was actually leaked and the entire voter database of the entire country to everyone. Um, so they had big data is a big issue um, in this campaign, and they had a and, and Netanyahu is a seasoned campaigner, and there's nobody who does it like he does it. Love him, hate him, doesn't matter. Nobody can beat him at what he does. And he did it. He really, really did it. His campaign, they were aggressive. Um, a lot of, it was an ugly campaign. A lot of Israelis aren't so happy about that, even people who support him. Um, but he, he really came through. And um, I think the election results are, are more of a reflection of Israelis who, I mean, I know people who hadn't voted in 20 years who went out and voted for Likud. Why? Because Likud really aggressively pursued them um, until they went to the polls, until the last minute from start to finish, Bibi was on. And all of his team was on today. And unfortunately, Good Mike didn't have the same uh, camp management and the same passion um, for the campaign and for the election. By the way, when you say they didn't have the same passion, it's a very telling comment. And one would assume, look, here in America, we're in the midst of the Democratic primary, and it looks right now like every other day, uh, one of the many hopefuls who were hoping to win the uh, nomination to be the Democratic candidate for president is dropping out. And there's a lot of discussion about the quality of their respective campaigns, and it may very well be that the candidate with the best can uh, best on the ground team is going to come out victorious. So if you if I hear you say, lo and behold, Likud had a far better machine, well, good for them. And in essence, I would have hoped that every one of the major parties at least had a good machine. I want you to I want you to respect to respond to something I hear all the time. What I hear all the time from Israelis is the following. It's enough already. We need a fresh face. This Netanyahu has been prime minister what seems like forever. He's the longest serving prime minister in Israel's history. It's time for a change. But, and this is echoed in America as well, there's nobody else that excites us. And that in the end, we vote for Netanyahu because although we wish there were an alternative, we can't find one. To what extent, Emily, do you think that that is true, that the Israeli electorate votes reluctantly for Netanyahu because they feel there's no one better? Um, I'm actually not sure that that's true at all, at least in this election, from what I saw and from everything leading up to it, especially, like I said, with the big data issue. This really does make a difference, especially when you're talking about a party that was established in 1970 campaigners who have been the incumbent for, for 14 years now. 
Um, he has a huge campaign leg up on Benny Gantz, who's never held public office. Um, so there's really no comparison when it comes to campaigning. I don't believe it's because there's a lack of truth of faith in Benny Gantz. I mean, he was the idea. There's a lot of faith in Benny Gantz as a leader. It's just that he doesn't have the experience. He isn't seen the same way um, in the public uh, compared to Netanyahu. And at the end of the day, Netanyahu did a better job getting the vote and getting people out of homes and to the polls and getting they, What's interesting about this election, actually, is that focusing on, like, the swing city, which could go to blue and white or could go to the Likud, they really, really focused on Likud's strong. Um, and blue and white trying to do the same thing at the end, towards the end of the election day, for the that. Blue and White sent out urgent messages to all of their campaigners. They sent um, they sent guns to one city. They sent to another. Uh, yeah, phone everybody. They sent out to type what up the area because they weren't getting the turnout. The periphery and places that are very very strongly the coup were they were on the ground getting that turnout. Um, another big winner in this election that we haven't discussed yet, actually is the Arab Party. Um, they came out with a, a, a very surprising, uh, a strong showing, and they've been increasing over time. And I know that we mentioned that um, is a like I would agree with that. Um, but at the same time, we see another shift that's coming. Um, and that is that there is more and more participation from the Arab public. Um, a lot of it does support more liberalism. And I'm really interested to see how this will go in the future, um, because before, you know, we saw a reluctance um, of the Arab, uh, the Arab community to participate in the electoral process. And now, really, for the first time, and I think it was the last election, the second election, we saw I'm okay actually encouraging people to vote. And we saw for the first time that Arabs, the Arab voters, would be happy if their government was actually in the coalition. At some point, there's going to have to be some level of cooperation and working together. And I know that before this election, they were even talking about that with Benny Gantz, the possibility of minority government with the lack of opposition from the Arab party. It doesn't seem like that will be an option this time. But this is definitely something we have to end with as a society in the very near future. Wonderful, Emily. I am so appreciative that you took the time. I'm sorry that Skype didn't work quite as well as I wish, so there was some time that maybe people did not hear everything you said, but your insight was wonderful, and I hope you appear with us very often on JBS. Thank you very much. Thank you. I thought a question that should be asked, one of the things that I did hear was that one of the reasons that the Arab list, the Arab joint list, did so well is that people who used to vote for labor or merits said they're not getting anything done and decided to vote for the Arab list. It would be very interesting to see what that dynamic okay, was. I wanted to, by the way, let's see again the results from the last three elections. Um, you know, given the fact that it's a parliamentary system, parties win a percentage of the votes based on the total number of votes. Exactly. So it's not simply that people who once voted, let's say, merits, were now voting for the Arabs. What could happen is they just weren't voting at all. And as a result, the total number goes down, and the same number of votes gives a party. A but these were people who were the, these were people who were talking to talking. These are from exit polls. People who were talking, and that seems to be something that was said. Steve, you talk to American Jewry all the time. One of the things you center your work on is the relationship between American Jewry and Israel. And I hear from American Jews all the time. They've had it with Netanyahu. American <laughs> Jews have had it with Netanyahu. And the American Jewish community, which tends to skew liberal, to tends to skew Democrat, in the American elections, they're very anti-Trump. They're very much pro almost anyone who's going to run on the Democratic Party. There seems to be a similar feeling in Israel about Israeli politics and that Netanyahu is associated with Trump. I want to know, in general, how you think American Jewry is going to react to this election in Israel if it turns out that, in fact, Netanyahu, despite all of his legal problems, despite them, he's going to be chosen by the Israeli people to lead the next coalition government. 
Well, first of all, the, uh, the distancing between American Jewry and Israel has far more to do with American Jewish assimilation than it has to do with, uh, with the relationship with, with, you know, with any particular Israeli political party. In other words, if you distance yourself from matters Jewish, generally, you're going to distance yourself from Israel. So in that respect, when, um, when American Jewish liberalism is articulated as a reason for distancing, that in many respects masks the underlying reasons for the distancing, namely... You don't feel that people in the American Jewish community are anti netanyahu Well, I'm not excluding that. Uh, first of all, as far as actual favorability ratings, uh, Netanyahu scores... He's a divisive figure, without question, among American Jews. In other words, basically he's got about 50% of American Jews that support him and maybe 50% that oppose him. You think him. it's that high? Um, it's, hard to, it's hard to be exact, but it's always been a rather polarizing figure. He's a controversial prime minister. And there's no getting around that. On the other hand, uh, if you're asking where is American Jewry today, my speculation at least is, number one, a sense of uh, it's a good idea that we finally have a government in Israel. Uh, in other <laughs> words, that uh, regardless of how this turns out, the very fact of a government is a good idea. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> All right, secondly... If the um, court doesn't overrule it. Oh, wait, you don't mean maybe. I absolutely I do mean maybe. I hear him. Maybe. Explain what maybe means. Well, there, are, there is a variety of scenarios that would happen. Assuming, just for, uh, for the sake of assumption, that you have just this, this anti-BB movement says we have to get rid of this 14-year prime minister who has been there for too long. Therefore, Lieberman will have to make a decision whether he hates BB more or the joint Arab list more. In which point, assuming that they have 61 and Netanyahu is 59, then 61 overcomes 59. I'm sorry, who, who has 61? The, uh, if Netanyahu, if the right wing bloc, Netanyahu's bloc has only 59. Yes. Then you have 61 on the other side. No, you Including don't. Including the Arab list. Including the Arabs. Yes. Yes. Wait Including a minute, wait, the Arabs. Whoa, wait a minute. Yeah. Are you now? And Beitano. Uh, but wait, I want to see the list again the, mm -hmm. from this but, election. Right. Put Arab it up on the screen for us to, to look at. I don't think they're anywhere near 61. Okay, Blue and White has 33, and the Coalition of Labor, Merits, and, uh, mm -hmm. and Gesher mm -hmm. has seven. That's 40 seats. No, no. Take Plus. the Arabs and Lieberman. Fine. If you add the yes, Arabs, that's, that's it. That's then what Then you I'm have saying. 54. No, you, then you have 60, 60, 60. You have 54. 61. You're making two, you're two leaps here. Sure. Okay? One leap is that, that in the end... Avigdor Lieberman is going to go with the I'm, left. I'm, you asked me and about the scenario. And right. you're making another mm -hmm. assumption, which I did not expect from you, mm -hmm. that 14 members of the joint Arab list are going to be embraced by Benny Gantz Correct. and become part of the coalition. <laughs> Correct. On a scale of 1 to 10, Shahar, how likely is that? On a scale of 1 to 10, what were the chances Israel will go with three no, elections no, no, in no, one no, year? No, 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 no. Scale of 1 to 10. I can't tell. Five. Four? Oh, four? Please. No? One. I one. Never. Steve, I said never. I said one. I don't think it's possible given who Lieberman is on the one hand. And number two, within the joint well, list. Lieberman and, and, and the, that may be the I one finish? where it comes. Within the joint list, you have one particular faction, the Balad faction, which is known as having at least one member who's been a supporter of terrorism. Other members are against, frankly, LBGTQ rights which is a, an, an, a divisive issue as well, no, not really as important as the other one. But under those circumstances, I, I just don't see a coalition that will include Lieberman on the one hand and the joint list on the other hand. No, 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 no. not coalition, Stephen. Assuming there is a 61 the minority vote government to bring approach. in a government, and that government will remove Netanyahu as prime minister, will establish a Gantz-led government, and this government, without Netanyahu in the political game, will go to elections right. one I more think time the, in four I months. think the odds of a national unity government, as remote as those are, are higher Maybe. than the odds of a... Under Bibi? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, I want to go on record. I don't think that's... I think, again, put the numbers up one more time, please. I want to go on record. Based on everything I've seen over the course of Israeli politics, the notion that the left is going to create a coalition of any kind, operative, minority, that involves temporary, four, temporary that involves 14 members of the Arab list, plus Avigdor Lieberman, is absolutely impossible. How, first impossible. of all, the updated exit poll gives one more seat to the Arabs. Doesn't matter. And I just want to mention one more thing. They, she, she mentioned, Emily mentioned aggressive work by Likud. Very true. 
Likud has been super efficient, but it goes beyond Likud itself. It's regardless of the database that Likud has, because the truth is that within that block, take Shas for example, they used Netanyahu as their banner. In their ad campaigns, they said, vote Shas, you're voting Netanyahu. In a way, it reminded me as if it's another image of Rebbe Vadia Yosef. Instead of using Rav Ovadia Yosef, they used Netanyahu. Right. And they still made, had an incredible achievement of maintaining nine seats. The second thing, uh, also, I mean... Uh, said you're, arg you're arguing against your other premise. That's fine. It's okay. Israeli politics. We do that at any given moment and uh, parallel. Okay. And then the second point well, we is Ayman Ode. we just have to watch you dance, yeah. that's all. And Ayman, <laughs> Ayman Ode. I want to talk about the joint Arab list. We spoke about the large turnout. Absolutely true. The Arabs, indeed, indeed... Think about 2015, Netanyahu moved in droves and voted. But what made them do it? On the one hand, you want to say increased participation in the Israeli society. And that's government. more democracy. Yeah. And that's a sign of a more cohesive society. Right. The second element is maybe they did it out of the, the, the anger of Netanyahu's remarks, as Ayman Ode continuously mentioned. And I'll also mention that he may have contributed to the more Likud voters coming out to vote because it was highlighted, the Likud campaign highlighted the Arab party's desire to move, remove Netanyahu from office. On any platform, Ayman Ode said, vote for us, it is our holy task to get Netanyahu out of power. We need to teach him a lesson. Now think about the middle section Israelis who will sit there and say, you know what, I'm not comfortable with Netanyahu's indictments. And then That's they would look to the, to the side and say, mm, but look at Ayman Ode. With that party, with Balad and others who We're negate... the Arab parties. Yes. yes the, yeah. But some of, it, some of the more extreme faction that you refer to, Stephen, and they say no, um, no Jewish state, and some of them supported Samir Kuntar and terrorist activities. Mm, so if I don't vote for Netanyahu, I may end up with them somehow. So maybe or I should... supporting it from outside the government. Or even supporting it from the outside. So that may, in its place, have motivated so much of the voting for Bibi. I wanted to ask you something else, because one of the other things that I have been hearing is that there were some people who said that voting for Netanyahu was voting for Donald Trump. People who, when you're in Israel... Where? In Israel. That when I spoke to people who said that they, they thought it was important um, because they, people that I spoke to who are expecting Donald Trump to win, I said, you're not listening to American television, but okay, um, and felt that if Donald Trump does win, they basing themselves on the recent trip when Donald Trump presented, when Trump, the administration presented its peace plan, um, considering the way both men came. Bibi got a lot of points in America for having really made sure to ask and say how important it was for Gantz to come too. Gantz didn't want to come with Bibi. He came before Bibi, which means Bibi fast in the sunlight of the, of the presentation. And there were people who said to me that they think Trump is going to win, and they thought that it would be better for Israel if Trump could deal with Netanyahu rather than dealing with Gantz based on the way both were at that time. Steve, what do you think? Let's and I was going to ask all of you, to what extent has the positions Donald Trump has taken, including the Trump administration peace plan, it, it seemed to me that it raised Netanyahu's stature at a critical moment. In fact, there were some people who said, oh, it was done only to help Netanyahu win. But in general, do you feel that Israelis voted for Netanyahu because they wanted to protect Donald Trump? It's hard to imagine that's a major factor. I mean, Trump is very popular in Israel. <laughs> He's very unpopular within the American Jewish community here. Um, in terms of uh, placing a vote, it, it doesn't make much sense to put all your eggs in one basket. So to, uh, to, to, to make your vote on the basis that you think the American president will necessarily get reelected, and therefore we need a prime minister that's going to be buddy-buddy with him, that's uh, very myopic political thinking. Um, I think it is fair to say that um, uh, you have a hotly contested Democratic Party election right now. You've got one candidate who has said Netanyahu was a racist. Um, under those circumstances... Oh, that, that was Bernie Sanders. That's quite true. Uh, under those circumstances, um, depending upon who the nominee is, uh, you could foresee coming out of this not a cozy American-Israeli relationship, but a rather tense one. If I were to criticize Netanyahu in terms of his record, I think he does have to stand on the notion that uh, there was a bipartisan consensus 
within American politics going back to 1948 for all intents and purposes of support for Israel. That bipartisan consensus has eroded badly. The Prime Minister contributed to it. I wouldn't say he caused it. How? But I certainly contributed to it. How? Well, he's embarrassing Obama by going, by going to Congress and, and giving that speech against, uh, against the Ira Iranian deal. His being so blatantly partisan uh, in terms of his favoritism for, for Trump, again, a very divisive, controversial figure in American politics. Um, Trump, in turn, basically has made statements of, if, you, if you're a loyal friend of Israel, you'll vote for me. If you're not a loyal friend of Israel, you vote for my opponents. Well, that's an awfully polarizing statement. So in that respect, the tendency towards partisanship in the U.S.-Israel relationship, number one, is a dangerous current, something we should watch out for in terms of the years ahead. In other words, try to correct it. Uh, I think in terms of uh, where American Jews are, we are, a lot of outreach needs to be done to strengthen the pro-Israel elements within the Democratic Party. Um, that's a necessary corrective. Uh, in terms of Israeli politics, if anyone was asking me for my advice, it would be keep your lines open with both parties and don't hinge everything upon who's going to be the next president. You've dealt with Israeli diplomacy. It's hard for me to believe that in the halls of the equivalent of the State Department of America, whatever it is for Israel, foreign ministry, that they don't understand that they could be dealing today with Trump and tomorrow they could be dealing with Sanders or they could be dealing with Biden and four years from now they could be dealing with somebody else and that from the Israeli perspective there is absolutely a desire to maintain bipartisan support in American Congress. And by the way, American Congress has been pretty bipartisan. The executive who has ever been in the White House has not been as, as balanced it seems to me, over the years, as Congress. Congress has been, up until very recently, very bipartisan when it comes to Israel, because the American people are bipartisan in their support. Fair enough. But very often, we felt the person occupying the White House... Has been on one side. Yes. But anyway, I'm asking you, to what extent, as you hear Americans talk about Trump and the Israeli election and bipartisan support and Democrats, opine for a moment for me. Well, I'll, I think it's um, quite reminiscent to what we see here in Washington. It's not necessarily that in the halls of diplomacy we'll hear the same thing as you hear with the executive. Right. So what the Israeli foreign ministry says and the prime ministers, for instance, political needs, sometimes clash and we know who's powerful. And the second element is what you mentioned about the Trump peace plan. I don't think Israelis thought about Trump to a degree when they voted or voted in favor of Netanyahu, especially when Netanyahu emphasized in the course of the campaign that he had to cope with a beleaguered president and administration in Obama. And even though he mentioned several times, I had a lot of respect towards him, we had major disagreements. However, you are correct, I think, Susie, in saying that the Trump peace plan has elevated Netanyahu to a degree, but more than it elevated, and I'm sorry to be the Israeli who pushes to the negative, it shone a light onto blue and white that blue and white had to make a decision on right. policy issues right. that had nothing to do with Bibi. Now you have to decide whether you're in favor of annexation, in favor of moving in that direction, and immediately you saw the fracture within the party. Some of it said yes, some of it said let's within wait. Within blue and white. Within blue and white. And that led to Netanyahu's campaign saying, I know what I am. And it's not about BB or no BB. We have a way, we have a policy, and you can trust me. And that is what hurt blue and white. It also might have helped Blue and White if Gantz had been there with Bibi and they might have presented a face together. I have to tell you, I completely, I think yeah. Gantz would have been swallowed in that light in between Trump yeah, he and was Netanyahu. Anyway. So, in that regard. But he was but anyway. Because he wasn't there, he wasn't swallowed. Yeah. He was there. No, no he was no. separate. He earlier. He wasn't in the, yeah. he wasn't the he was bologna not, in the sandwich. No. He, was he wasn't not overshadowed on television. Yes. Right. That's right. true. He wasn't figure. overshadowed on right. television. Right. That is exactly. true. Exactly. Uh -huh. Exactly. Um, he also refused, if you remember, uh, one of the issues that came up in the campaign was to have a debate between Netanyahu and Gantz. Now, the past, uh, the past election, Netanyahu was the one who said no. In this election, he pushed for a debate, and Gantz said no. On what grounds? I don't mean what, what was. What do you think the reason was Gantz didn't want to stand on a stage with Netanyahu? Think about this. Who would stand in the stage and debate yes, Netanyahu? But, uh, but he wanted it election, before. They, it, he was willing to do it. Yeah, what changed? The Netanyahu's um, towering presence and oratory abilities with a heightened attention after the Trump peace plan. After the Trump, after the Trump peace, peace plan, plan. And elevated those issues would have put 
uh, Gantz, not only in the sense of you know, coping with somebody as eloquent as Netanyahu, but also he would have had to make decisions on the issues themselves, and maybe, just maybe, Blue and White was not as ready to make those decisions there. Steve, what do you make of the fact that Israel is about to elect, looks like, to lead the government, somebody who is under serious criminal indictment. He has already been indicted, and as Shachar alluded to earlier, the question is, is something going to be done in the Knesset to protect him, to, to shield him, or is there going to be an attempt in, other, in, in some way to undercut him and to throw him to the wolves, even if he is prime minister? How do you see all this? Back, uh, back when I was in college in the early 1970s, uh, you know, we had the impeachment uh, affair with President Nixon. The argument was made then by highly respected rabbis, including Dr. Norman Lamb, that uh, in Jewish tradition, no individual is above the law. Now, what you have right now, which should be of concern to us, is what's called the override clause before the Knesset, meaning that essentially the Knesset can pass legislation. The Supreme Court can declare it unconstitutional. That should be the end of the matter. In it's, Israel, we're right. talking. Right. With the override clause, if the Knesset passes it a second time, that ends the matter. Right. Now, that should be of concern to us because uh, it suggests that uh, if, the, uh, if legislation was passed exempting uh, the prime minister from, um, you know, from a serious, well, he's under indictment anyway, but from conviction, you know, from serving, serving time, or being removed from office because of illegalities, you have a situation where it says, yes, there's one person who's above the law. As a Jew, I have, uh, I have a lot of problems. But with I, that. I have to ask you this. There are two <laughs> things that you mentioned. One, and this is a subject for a discussion, a proper discussion. You mentioned the word unconstitutional. If the court declares something as unconstitutional, <laughs> remembering that Israel is no constitution, yeah. that in itself is a discussion in Israel. The second element Did is... Did you use the word unconstitutional? Yes. Well, ba yes. there are ba the basic laws right. are in place are perceived of the constitution. to be constructed it by the Barak court, but this is contested. And this is not a given, as um, chief, uh, one of the chief justices, Mishael Cheshin, once uh, qu quote in a minority opinion, on the same judgment where Aaron Barak and Shamgar decided that there is, you can interpret basic laws as constitution. It was Cheshin who said, I have seen no Mount Sinai nor thunder or lightning that would herald the coming of a constitution. And that's a debate. The second element okay, I want to... Steve's issue isn't about whether it is or not a constitution. No. His question is... Is Israel committed to the principle of the rule of law? Well, but, but, but for all individuals. Yeah, but being able to take something, and that's the second point I wanted to make. You're mentioning the override clause, but this is again the discussion of the sovereignty of the people. Can the court interpret its own powers and responsibilities in a way that not only gives it more power, but also is able to overcome what the sovereign, the sovereignty of the people, as it's manifested in the Knesset, has decided? These are not the simple questions of is the what, Knesset. Is what you, is, you are calling the election of a prime minister and, a, and through Likud, through an, an election, that's the sovereignty you're referring and to. And in the override clause, when an override clause means that the Knesset will legislate so, and if the Knesset legislated so, what should be the power of the court to withdraw that, that ability of the Knesset to legislate? Okay, having said that, Steve's point is he's worried, and it's a, you use the word us. That is the word that I caught in my ear. I don't care whether it bothers us. I do care whether it bothers the Israeli people. So Steve's point is he doesn't think the Israeli people will be served well if a prime minister is not also held to the law. My understanding was the only way Netanyahu would avoid basically conviction and incarceration is if, number one, it wasn't proved, or number two, the argument was made similar to what we've heard in the United States, that while he's a sitting prime minister, you leave him alone. Yeah. Right. After he's prime minister, he's fair game. I don't consider that to be yeah. uh, anybody is above the law if it applies to anybody who is in our country president or in Israel prime minister. So while I'm sensitive to what you say, I don't experience the fear that in some way Israel is making a statement that the prime minister is above the law. For me, it seems like it'll be within the legal structure of the state of Israel. Look, Richard Nixon won the 72 election with 49 states out of 50. 
It was an overwhelming victory. The impeachment proceeding continued. He issued a statement saying the sovereign has the right. So the issue was should he give over the tapes. He says the sovereign has the right to refuse to give over this information. That was making a statement that he's above the law. Did he use the word sovereign? He used the word sovereign. The Supreme Court argued by a 9 to 0 vote that no, no one is above the law. The tapes have to be given over, and that led to his resignation. Excellent. Well, well, I don't see the analogy. Help me with the analogy. Um, look, there's a legal process here, and uh, there, are, there are three different counts of indictment against the prime minister. I think it behooves pretty much everyone to let that legal process play itself out. Um, Short-circuiting it by saying it doesn't apply to someone because he occupies an important office right now. I think that's a violation of, of that principle. What do you think? I think that the idea of saying that a sitting prime minister, someone who's in that position, they're not saying he's off the hook forever. They're saying he's off the hook while he is serving at the people's, well, while he is serving at the pleasure of the people, if you will, who elected him, and that this is something that he will have to face when he is no longer okay. prime minister. And what, how do you respond to Steve's point, which is that a president of the United States who was proven to break the law ultimately was forced to resign because there would have been impeachment and most likely there would have been conviction. The president was forced to resign because he had lost the support of the people as expressed in Congress. The people said, his own party said, Mr. President, we will not support you. When that happened, he had, no, he had no. And you say? I will say this. You have to remember that as opposed to the US, Israel doesn't have a constitution. And it's an ongoing issue. Now, why whether is that? I keep interrupting you there because I don't understand why that's relevant. Oh, that is super relevant. First of all, it's one of the major political issues in Israel but today. But explain to me I'll in explain. terms of Steve's point. I'll explain. I'll explain. First of all, the rule of law, well, not the I, Constitution. I understand. And, and again, all I'm trying to shine, it's not a clear-cut case. There is a reason why the Israeli law does not pertain to a prime minister who is indicted. There is an indication for a deputy minister and a minister who have to resign. And even there, it was an interpretation of the Supreme Court, but well accepted. But because we're dealing with a prime minister, Israeli law refrained from saying that an indicted prime minister has to resign. That means that Netanyahu, under the current situation, will move to rule Israel, given that the results are correct. Govern. Govern, govern, govern. sorry, govern. I apologize. Govern. govern. But at the same time, he will have to manage his affairs in court. He's not above the law. He will have to appear before the court on March 17th and start managing his defense. How can he, over, how can he bypass that only if there is a law passed in the Knesset that gives him temporary immunity exactly. or the French law until he finishes his term as prime minister. But that is far from being guaranteed, even within Likud itself. Even if he gains 61 without Lieberman, within Likud himself, members of Knesset such as Gidon Saar have expressed their opinions that they will not support such a move by the prime minister. And given that the prime minister himself said that I will manage my affairs, I can do both easy, easily simultaneously, and it will be easier for him to do it from the chair of the prime minister. All I'm trying to do, Mark, and that's to conclude the legal point, is to understand that the situation as far as the legality in Israel is important to understand that there is a battle between those who believe that the court, the Supreme Court, has that interpretive power to rule uh, out uh, laws of the Knesset, and those who believe that that power was taken by force, by Barak's interpretation, and the Israeli Supreme Court has to be more representative of the people. How did that manifest itself in these elections? When the Supreme Court had to rule about the ability to participate in the election of Michael Ben Ari, who was a member of Jewish Power Party, Itamar Ben Gvir, they ruled him not to be able to run. However, when the case of Heba Yazbak came on, mm -hmm. which is the joint Arab list, and Heba Yazbak has expressed opinions supporting Samir Kuntar, the abominable terrorist who was taken out by Israel, but did what he did to Israeli children and acted against Israeli civilians, and the Central Election Committee, decided that both Mikhail Ben-Ari and Hiba Yazbak are not able to run in the elections. It was the Israeli Supreme Court that sustained the decision about Mikhail Ben-Ari, but overruled the Central Election right. Committee and allowed Hiba Yazbak to run. There is a great amount of debate 
about the Israeli Supreme Court's image exactly. and whether we need to move in the direction of a more representative Supreme Court or a professional Supreme Court. And that cannot be, lo we can't look the other way. We have to face this issue and that issue also shines a light now because what happened is that the Israeli legal establishment has been under attack by the Prime Minister has been under attack by Netanyahu continuously claiming that this is not a real case against him. And come out the Israeli electorate and vote en masse, not only in favor of Netanyahu, but against the Israeli legal system. And this is a Precisely. very problematic issue that we have to contend with as a society, which, by the way, feeds into your concern. Exactly. Perhaps I have too many American glasses on, but uh, <laughs> uh, an independent judiciary does stand in terms of checks and balances. And it's, it's, it's essential to... But that's to not it. But they don't have the court I, I, the system I hear, the way I, we I, have I, it. I hear you, but I'm saying that the checks and balances between independent organs of government serves to prevent anyone going too far in one direction, too far in the other direction. Governmental control of the judiciary in that respect, in other words, a non-independent judiciary, one that cannot afford to say, this law, we don't like it, we think it's wrong, but we can't say it because it reflects simply the will of the people, I don't think that's particularly healthy in terms of democratic society. I have another but you question. would have the situation in, in the United States where you have a Senate that has to confirm the judges. The judges are appointed by themselves, and the Knesset, which is the voice of the people, has nothing to say yes, about it. Yes, I will it. make, by the way, this general appointment for our audience. That, and in, in essence, this is what Shachar is saying as well. Israel does not have an American-style government right. at all. It is very similar, it's a democracy, and there are s branches of government, but they are not formally constructed the way we are constructed. And I think that we think our construct is a very positive one, and I wholly agree with you that it would be very good for Israel to have an independent Supreme Court, which you know those on the right say, oh, that's too far liberal. Well. We live with that in America. We had the Warren Court, and the right was all upset. The court seems to be leaning more right now, and the left is upset. But you have to live with that. And it would be interesting to see where Israel goes. And there are some who say at some point Israel should have a constitution, although it may never get there. I, have, I want to move on before we run out of time. I want to the extent to which the issue was only Netanyahu. Was it only peace with the Palestinians and a, the security issue with, and Iran and Netanyahu will keep us safe? Or were there any social issues driving the Israeli electorate? And is the electorate, because when I talk to Israelis here in America, especially those who were terribly against Netanyahu, what he said was that of the Netanyahu, the society has in some way deteriorated, that the society is more willing to say terrible things about Arabs. And at one point, you didn't hear these things in the Israeli, among the Israeli people. And that there's less of a concern and less of a, uh, an embracing of non-Jews and Arab Israelis, and for that matter, what should happen to the Palestinians. And social services are suffering Jewish education and public education in Israel is suffering. To what extent are those issues, what we would normally call in America internal domestic issues, to what extent did they play any role at all in the Israeli politics? Didn't hear a thing. You didn't hear a thing. Well, 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 the Labor Party did campaign on those grounds. In other words, they said our constituency is concerned about transportation on Shabbat because People can't afford cars, they can't afford taxis, how they're gonna to get to the beach on that one day of rest. So the Labor Party did campaign deliberately, not on the foreign policy issues, which is what you might have expected. They campaigned on the issues of uh, you know, internal social welfare, um, education, education type issues. So I don't think those issues are irrelevant. Uh, on the other hand, they were dwarfed, if you will, by the question of whom do you want as prime minister, whom do you trust, who can best manage Israeli security. And that is still number one. Exactly. Plus, added to that, that Mizrael did have a good number of successes in terms of Israel's image in the Arab world. Not oh. in terms of the Palestinians, but in terms of the rest yes. of the Arab world. So in that respect, it was a choice between a, a prime minister under indictment 
and a prime minister that has been successful. Okay. And people made their choices accordingly. Take a quick minute because we're running out of time. What's your sense of this question? I think this, this election was only about Netanyahu, yes or no. I don't think that, the, look at Labour from um, 10 seats together with merits in April of last year to six, from six to 10 and then uh, in uh, September and now six. The Israeli public has spoken. The social issues didn't play a part. It was just Netanyahu, yes or Netanyahu, no. And if you look into the needs of Israeli society, there are some dire issues that need to be taken care of. Are you disappointed in that? When, yes. you look, when you look at the Israeli electorate and they are not concerned about these domestic social issues, does that trouble you well, at no, all? Not as concerned, but I am disappointed at the low level that we've reached in the last year when it comes to the election. If you look, if you monitor social media and you see the kind of discourse that was taken when the prime minister publishes a video, Netanyahu publishes a video calling Gantz demented, or videos coming from those directions indicating affairs with, with underage girls oh, or wait. other stories. That happens well. Uh, that's not no, right. no, it not was different here. in Israel. But Mark. I'm not talking it about was, that. But it was I'm different. talking about a tone of Israeli society. And that, again, I'm just telling you what yeah, is, right. Israelis on the left tell me all the time that there's a, a deterioration under Netanyahu of, an American word, civility and concern for the well-being of ordinary Israelis who are, I mean, there is a huge income in, in gap in Israel as well as, well as in the United States. And Correct. I'm just, you know, I, it's surprising to me that none of that is an issue. And you've made it very clear you don't feel this time it is. One but I am disappointed. Yes, okay, one last question, and it's for you to begin with. Even if the numbers, put them up one more time, the numbers from this election, Again, we only have a couple of minutes. At the moment, the total number of seats, Likud, Shas, United, Torah, Yamina, is 60. 59, updated. Just a minute. On the screen, it's 60. It could be 59. Depends which poll you want. But whether it's 59 or 60, it's not enough. Where do you think Netanyahu is going to get the one or two or three additional votes and Knesset members to put him over the top. Where's it going to come from? Either blue and white. Who? He could go to some Who? of the right-wing members of blue Who? and white. Potentially Yoaz Hendel, Tzvi Hauser, who was the secretary mm -hmm. of the government, right. and others like. Or the other uh, easier path, Yes. it would be Orly Levy from Gesher. Because Orly Levy from Gesher represents that social aspect, and she does. she's not, as far as the uh, type of uh, supporters, she's not labor nor real merits. Right. And uh, in addition, she's already a faction. She doesn't have to part ways. This was a technical okay. block. So, so she, she could just go over. She could just go over. Without, be, without him offering her a And I can see the case to be a powerful yes. social minister. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. Without Orly machine. Levy is not a name most American Jews know. Well, they might remember her father, David Levy. Correct. Uh, he was right. foreign minister under, under Likud government. Correct. But uh, frankly, uh, Shachar is correct. Great right adversary of Bibi. Right. But the two names being mentioned right now precisely are Orly Levy, number one, and uh, uh, Hendel. What's his right. first name again? Yoaz. Yoaz. Yoaz, Yoaz. Yoaz Hendel, number two. Okay. So those are the obvious choices. And they, they will have to basically leave their own parties right. to and join the coalition. That happens, they, he happened already before. Is a yes. Moshe Dayan strengthened Likud enormously by leaving labor to become Begin's foreign okay. minister. It is wonderful hearing the three of you discuss this. It was wonderful, have, wonderful having Emily as well. And we're going to continue to stay on this. So you're going to be, I'm going to keep turning to you. But Susie, thank you. Stephen, thank you. Shachar, thank you. That's JBS's report on the Israeli election results for March 2nd, 2020. The story is far from finished. We'll be bringing you information on a daily basis right here on JBS. My thanks tonight to all of our panelists, Steve Baim, Susie Rosenbluth, Emily Schrader, and of course JBS's Tisha Bader and Shachar Azami. Thanks also to our director, Sloan Copeland, and JBS managing director, Dara Golub, technical manager, M Michael Paley, transmission manager, John McDevitt, and to the producer of tonight's Israeli election results, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.